Hey, you doing the intro? Yeah. Cool. How have you been? I feel like it's been a long time since I've seen you. Good, good. Feels good, right? Yeah. <laughs> good. Good, healthy, happy. Yes, somewhat less now. I'm busier with others. I got a new nephew on Sunday. My sister had a baby, yeah, so we're all gushing over that right now. <laughs> oh, I know, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. 
So I'm surprised to see so many people here tonight. Uh, Omar Abel's talk is next week. <laughs> sure, I think you've got your venture week. <laughs> so I uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks to Inform for organizing this, this talk about my book. And it's something that started two years ago as a pandemic project and I didn't really know how to start the book. I've written a lot of council reports and, and uh, a few um, uh, art, uh, articles in the Globe and Mail, but I didn't really know how to write a book. And so I asked a few people that I knew that were in the book business, and one of them said, well, why would anyone want to read your memoir? You're not famous, and you're not a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> that person, you'll have to read the book to find out who that person was. I won't reveal her name. <laughs> She was probably right. I'm not Lord Foster and I'm not Alice Munro, but I do mention both of them in my book because there is a connection. <laughs> Growing up in Southern Ontario, so did Alice Munro, so there you go, that's the connection. But it is a, uh, uh, I started to write uh, thinking about a pandemic project and I wasn't very good at sourdough and I thought maybe putting a book together would be something to do. And I started with five chapters and I've written a few kind of drafts of stories and it turns out all of them had to do with places I've lived. And uh, I fleshed out the book proposal and there were 18 chapters, 18 places. And so that's what a dress book is. It's not a, it's not a little black book about favorite places or restaurants or hotels and travel things. That's a completely different story and I'm sure everybody here could write the same thing. But my addresses are places that I've actually had a mailing address where I've actually lived long enough to get to know a place and to uh, live or uh, work or study in different places. So that's what each of the chapters is about. And how do you start writing a book? Well, it is a trip down 
memory lane starts by going through boxes and boxes and boxes of old letters and files and old notebooks. Some of them were kind of water damaged, and so some of the dates are not quite correct. So uh, their chapter on Italy is a little bit uh, maybe fuzzy for, for specific dates. So give me, give me some latitude there. But uh, aerogram uh, letters home, and so there's one <coughs> that I wrote to my parents when I was studying art and architectural history in Paris. And I didn't know until I found that letter, my mother had three boys, that I actually stayed at the Centre Didot in Paris. And that's, I completely forgotten the name of this place, reading the street, but it was this hostel for the a summer studies in, in Paris. And <coughs> of course, slides were a, a great source of information. And I've kept, in my career, I kept uh, uh, volumes of slides carefully organized and labeled. But these were the ones that never made the cut, and they were in a big box. And I went through every one, thinking there might be something of, of interest to, that I've forgotten. But one of them was this photograph here of a BOAC Tumbojet, 1972 at Heathrow Airport. <clears throat> and that was my very first trip abroad, it was in high school, grade 12 uh, English class. We spent March break in London, and we got to fly on a BOAC jumbo jet. And in 1972, because I've done the research on this, is the second year that a jumbo jet had flown to uh, Malton Airport in Toronto. So it was a big deal. <coughs> My father was an Air Force uh, navigator. He drove me to the airport. Very, very proud that I was going on, on a jumbo jet. And guess who got to sit in first class? Because the whole plane is chartered for high school students, but somebody had to sit in first class. Uh, <laughs> and I was in row one k so <laughs> champagne glass and a napkin and everything that I had, including this picture I took with a rolly B-35, which was a little camera I had my brother had given me with a, a telescoping lens, and so I still have that camera. So the first chapter is Roseburg, 12 Rosebury Place, so that's where I grew up, in St. Thomas, Ontario. And people that I've known for many years hear me talk about St. Thomas, St. Thomas, St. Thomas. And, well, this is the house that I grew up in, so the white columns, the last house before. The last of the modest houses before the nice houses further down the road were <laughs> And every, all the like, nicer houses were set far back. They had swimming pools in the backyard, they had jaguars in their front driveway. But we had this very modest house for the London family. And uh, I talk about my book, my mother, my parents, and they moved into this house two weeks before I was born, so 1954. So it has a long, <coughs> long-standing connection to, I guess, how I grew up. And I talk in my book about food quite a bit. And this is a, a recipe my mother made of chili sauce, a very Southern Ontario thing. And so every year I make chili sauce. And the recipe for it is in the chapter of Rosemary. <laughs> so this is St. Thomas, <coughs> deep in the heart of southwestern Ontario, halfway between Detroit and Buffalo. So it was a, it is still called the railway capital of Canada because at one point there were five, five railway lines that went through St. Thomas. And it had this magnificent Canada Southern New York Central Station in 1873, uh, 400 feet long. It's in one of the largest passenger stations in, in Ontario. It has a church that goes back to 1822, uh, Alma College, <coughs> quite a uh, well known uh, private girls' school that, that many people had been to that I bumped into at a conference last November in, from Georgia, from Atlanta, I said, I'm living in Stratford now. And she said, oh, I know somebody who went to Alma College. I mean, how does someone from Georgia mm -hmm. end up going to Alma College in St. Thomas and Perry? But it's probably most famous for the death of Jumbo. <coughs> so it's a sad uh, mantle to carry for a city to be the place where the largest elephant in the world met his demise in 1885 and a block from my grandmother's house. And so uh, P.T. Barnum was quite the <coughs> entrepreneur and promoter. And so he managed to get the high of Jumbo uh, given to Tufts University. And there are a couple of people here tonight that went to Tufts University that can attest that the sports teams at Tufts University were called the Jumbos after this. And his uh, skeleton went to the American Museum of Natural History. It's in a warehouse someplace in Britain. Brooklyn right now. So the other, the are houses, and I'm talking mainly about houses tonight in, in the book. And so some of these are the houses that are influenced uh, me. Here's on the right, the red brick high Victorian one with my, my grandparents' house, 100 Wellington Street. And on the far left is my aunt and uncle's house, a kind of a high Victorian house that I spent quite a bit of time in because I was their surrogate son. 
And Uncle Don <coughs> McDougall was an avid uh, woodworker, and he restored clocks, he restored furniture, and he restored the balustrade, this, this Victorian house, with walnut, uh, walnut rosettes that I helped him make in the Fifth Eastman workshop. But the other connection uh, that was an influence to my life was Uncle Don's brother, Clark McDougall, who's an artist, who of some note in, in uh, Ontario, he, has, he, had a, he had an exhibit here at the Vancouver Art Gallery in the 70s, uh, and he was a, quite a um, peculiar painter. He painted black uh, acrylic outlines of derelict houses and derelict barns all through southern Ontario, particularly in Melbourne County. And <clears throat> the summer I went to Paris, he wrote to me a, a letter in the back asking me to take pictures of uh, street details in Paris because he might want to do street scenes in Paris because he liked uh, street scenes like this one in St. Thomas that says Anne's Snack Bar where it just rained and there's a shiny uh, surface on the sidewalk. And so this idea of reflection and light is something that I, I found quite fascinating. So he wrote me this letter with uh, page after page of details of what he wanted me to uh, to see and observe and take slides for him when I was in Paris. And my favorite house on Rosebury Place was number 24, the Andersons, and they had the department store in town. And I always found this, this kind of quite uh, austere, formal, symmetrical house with this hip group of slate tiles and vitrified group. Fascinating. And I'd heard a rumor that it was a renovation. And I did some research on it with the help of my high school history teacher. In fact, the upper upper left photo, not the uh, far left, but the center left, is what the house looked like when it first built in 1904. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it was a major renovation of, by this architect, Bud Moore, who was the sister of, or the husband of the mm -hmm. Mrs. Anderson. So he took away the bell eaves, he took away the dormer. It was otherwise a symmetrical plan, took the porch off, he left the chimney, which was supposed to be the chimney, and put this parterre on the bottom. And I, I always found it a fascinating mm -hmm. uh, example of kind of austere but elegant architecture. But it was years later that I, when I learned about uh, Edwin Luxon, that he had designed a house that looks very similar in 1912 in Kent, the Salutation. So I wonder if Bud Morley maybe knew about Edwin Luxon's, had been to Kent, um, maybe it was the inspiration for this, this overhaul of the house. So the next address is Pentry Lane in Ottawa. <coughs> I went to Carleton University. I was resoundingly rejected from uh, U of T and from University of Waterloo. And in a de dejected state, I decided I was going to be a geography teacher at Waterloo. So I, I was all signed up for geography. When Carlton sent me a letter saying, you can come and be in our inaugural industrial design course, which is two years of architecture and two years of in, uh, engineering. So I went off to Carlton site unseen and discovered the School of Architecture, which had just, just opened a few years earlier, designed by uh, Carmen Cornell and uh, Doug Shabble was the director who, who had the building commissioned, and spent six years in a five-year program at uh, Carleton. <laughs> well, it took a year of work, so <laughs> I wasn't sit at that. I actually ended up graduating at the top of my class, so it took a while. And then something about architectural education, I think, a two or three year program just isn't long enough to learn about architecture. And I took what, six years for a five year program. And I think it was really important to have that time to learn how an architect uh, absorbs information and disseminates information. And so the idea of the way you present your ideas is as important as the ideas itself in many, many cases. So here I am, bottom left, in the uh, the townhouse in Pentry Lane came with a red, 30 foot long red vinyl snake. And it was a sublet from a professor, an American professor. And uh, it was a place that uh, used to have black hair, as you can see. <laughs> More of it. And another house that I found in the slides uh, was a project at Carleton. And we had a, the, our second to last year, we had a, a country house studio that Frank Carter led. And we had to, first of all, do an analysis of a country house, and I chose uh, Venturi Roche's uh, Brandt House in Greenwich, Connecticut. It just finished a few years earlier, because I like the idea of this kind of quirky, modern take on a villa, kind of clad in green uh, brick tiles. And I decided to create a, a country house that's based on Ontario uh, Gothic farmhouses, and you see them all over uh, Ontario. 
sometimes red brick, sometimes yellow brick, sometimes stone, but they used to have a single peak in the front and a front door that's never used. No one ever goes in the front door. We quite often don't have steps to the front door. So uh, I designed a house that had a, a fake front in red brick and the, back, the door was at the, the rear as it, as it used to be this. In the fourth year, there was a group of us at Carleton that went for a term at the Architectural Association in London. So uh, the, that chapter is called 43 Arkwright Road. And if you know your London uh, postcode, the NW3 is uh, Hempstead. And so it sounded wonderful in the time, time out listed garden flat in Hempstead. And here it is in the upper right, 43 Arkwright Road. A dreary fly, <laughs> not a dreary bit. It was cold, cold water. It was like, I don't know how we survived for three months in January, February, March, and April. But uh, we had uh, enjoyed the pleasures of, of London, uh, Ar the Architectural Associations here at Bedford Square, with grand uh, position in, in central London, and discovered things like Sir John Stone House and Museum and many other treasures. Uh, another studies abroad I was actually finishing my uh, house and finishing my master's degree was. Uh, 20 years later, in 1998, I went to the University of York, the one in England, and uh, uh, stayed at a, another dreary Victorian house called 25 Howard Street, Howard Street. And it happened to be at the end of Howard Street. And Castle Howard, of course, is near York, which is the scene Bryce had revisited, you know, all about Castle Howard. So it didn't take long for a, a colleague of mine to dub my dreary place Castle Howard Day. <laughs> so a lot of this story is about living in a, another cold water room, seven feet by 10 feet, with one, one plug, one air light bulb, and no, no hot water. Well, they had hot water, but the other room, housemates were too cheap to actually turn it on. So they lived there, for, my flatmate, lived there for 15 years with no hot water. <laughs> he blamed Margaret Thatcher on his lot of life. And all of it here is carping about you know, his lot of life. And, and uh, anyway, I tried to, to avoid uh, too much contact with people. <laughs> the one thing we tried to uh, set the house on fire was with leaving the gas hob on as I went in to wash all the dishes, boiling water, and it was quite the routine. So going back to school uh, has its, had its challenges, and its reward, and the reward was my uh, thesis. And I didn't, when I went to, um, uh, went to York in May of 90, I didn't really know what my thesis topic was gonna be. But the first thing our group did was went off to, to Prague for a study trip and went to Prague and I discovered Joseph Fletchnik, I think I spelled his name wrong here. Uh, but I was intrigued that in the 1930s he had reimagined the historic uh, castle of, of Prague Castle to make it a more democratic <coughs> republic for the, his presidency as the new uh, president of the Czechoslovakia. And he, he had these quite quirky modern interventions that I thought were quite fascinating. So I decided to, to uh, focus on how uh, additions and new buildings fit in historic settings. And that's why it's called modernism in context. So I looked at buildings from the 20th century, how they fit in historic settings. And I won't go too much detail about that because they're not all houses. But some of the places I looked at were ma mainly on university campuses. I visited 68 sites in England and in Denmark. Uh, to narrow down the field of candidates for a, a, a study. And in things like Palace Green Library by George Pace in Durham, uh, the Crypts Building at Cambridge by Paul Moy in 1967, St. Catherine's Co College in Oxford, Arnie Ockeston, probably one of, the, one of the most beautiful modern buildings, I think, anywhere, which is about the same time that Ron Tom was designing the Massey College in, in Toronto, just a few years different. But a, a remarkable one was at Aarhus University. Aarhus is the second largest city in, in Denmark. And my colleague, and, and yes, uh, Ben Delang, had sent me there, so you should see what Kai Fisker did at the Aarhus University. And uh, it's, it, it, considering it's 1930, it's this entire campus of very simple buildings, uh, repetitious building shapes, the same material, this sort of beige, uh, beige, yellow brick, very traditionally Danish. Uh, uh, country buildings are built of this, and he made an entire university campus out of it, and I thought it was quite a remarkable achievement. Uh, another colleague, <coughs> Inez Caillou, uh, uh, who I met in studying in Rome, I studied in at uh, Ypres. And here we are in the top right hand corner, There's, we're at Castle, uh, Castle Vecchio. So we did a study of, of Carlos Garfa for 
for uh, my studies in Rome, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Uh, I kept a good friendship with Inez, and in many trips to France, she introduced me to uh, what I call five or six French houses, and some of them are the ones that we had special uh, entree to, the Villa Savoie, when it was closed for restoration. Here's Inez and my friend Benta with uh, Inez's little son Cosimo, and it's because of Cosimo that we got in to see the Villa Savoie, because Madame Pipi wasn't going to let us in except having a kid really help. So if you're <laughs> traveling in Europe and the sign says closed, help, help will have a V in our charming way. And then we had the, uh, we went to see the Maison, uh, Maison de Verre, which is a remarkable thing. You can't photograph it, so I did a kind of a tableau or a montage of images of it. But the most remarkable thing uh, that I didn't realize is that the bottom, it's the bottom three floors of an apartment building. It was the two stories of apartments. They built this underneath it, and it was quite a remarkable uh, revelation. There was a house by Edwin Lutchens that we saw, but probably the most interesting is the Maison Jean Prouvé in Nancy. And <coughs> and yeah, this is the bottom right here. Um, she, lived in, she worked for the Monument Historique de la France as a restoration architect. And while she was posted in Nancy, the city of Nancy owned the Jean Prouvé's house and just on a hill overlooking the city. And she was uh, allowed to stay there as long as she oversaw the restoration work. And so they were putting in, redoing the heated floors. This building is 1954. It could easily be in West Vancouver at the same time, although more interesting uh, innovations with metal, use of metals, with huge uh, pivoting doors into the main salon, the aluminum panels. Every door inside the house is like a ship's bulkhead. So there's like a rounded edge that you step up and over. And, and I got to stay there for a few days and slept in Jean Prouvé's own bed with Inez's mother's shell tape linen embroidered sheets. And I'm a kind of fussy about sheets. And so I had probably the best sleep of my life was in Jean Prouvé's bed. <laughs> Inez's mother's shell tape sheets. Another house we saw, who knew that Albert Alto had a house in France? And this is uh, about 40 kilometers west of for an uh, art dealer, <coughs> and he's like Louis Perry, and Bob Lettingham. Uh, having seen this remarkable work of Finnish architecture, it could very well be in the suburbs of, of Helsinki. And it's, pre it's preserved as a, as a house museum. Another uh, sort of, never really lived in Dorset, but visited many times. And I, we got, I call it Wessex because it's very much the Thomas Hardy part of Dorset where uh, good friends from Vancouver had a country house for, for many, many years. And uh, Bob and I got to visit on many occasions when we were invited to go to Blindburg to the Opera Festival. And they uh, trusted me to help them with their farmhouse, Lower Oak Farm, which is one on the right. So Melbury is the main house on the upper left, but the modest farmhouse, but it's grade two listed, uh, 18th, 19th century uh, farmhouse. I was allowed to help them completely reconfigure the interior as long as the exterior remained the same. And so that was quite a treat to be able to, to uh, be involved in that and stay there. In fact, it was the, my uh, house of refuge when the, my flatmate in York threatened to burn the house down. I escaped to uh, finish writing my thesis in, uh, at Lower Hope Farm. Another uh, complete, you'll see very little similarity about what I've talked about. So here's this, this chapter called Just Off Melrose in Los Angeles, well, Hollywood, West Hollywood. And, and from very well, I had very good friends that lived in uh, the left of those two white buildings in their mirror image. They're at the corner of uh, Waring and Sweetser in West Hollywood, a block from the Schindler House. And they're kind of Moroccan revival, 1926. And they lived in the left house uh, upstairs in an apartment. And then they actually acquired the right house, which is on the corner, which was derelict and they bought it for uh, back taxes. And it was filled with Orders junk. I mean, I, I, you have to read the chapter called uh, Just Off Miller's to find out exactly what was in that house when they, they took out the keys. But they had to clean it all out, and there were, they found treasures, though. There were wooden frames and wooden archways and wooden shutters and wooden panels. There was uh, inlaid furniture. There were books about Moroccan architecture and tiles. So this person who was in, I think, in the movie industry had collected all these things to do with Morocco. And uh, we used, I used that, it asked me to reincorporate them into the renovated interior. And, and they filled it with their own uh, hoard 
uh, but quite exquisite objects in bronzes and majolica and, and uh, cloudy day enamel and uh, the, the sky is the limit of the stuff that these guys collect. They, they just display quite, quite beautifully. So that was kind of fun. I'd never want to live in LA, but this is kind of, kind of fun to take a trip down, you know, what fantasy would be like if you were, if you were uh, living in Los Angeles. And then closer to home is the Barber House. There's a chapter about that in the book. And many of you probably have been in this, in this house. It uh, was designed by Ross Lord in 1936. And uh, it was the home that Bob Lettyhead and I had since, well, we bought it in 1988. It took almost two years to go through planning and, and uh, a restoration and construction for, for the new house in the back. Um, we had to go through a number of neighborhood challenges to get the second house built. And for a while it was the pioneer of, it's not really a laneway house, it's not actually an infill, it's technically a second house on the property because it was two lots. So the city allowed it to be built the same size as the front of the heritage house uh, because there were two lots and the, the density then was equal of the two new buildings. The other place that we had for, in fact, all our uh, life together uh, with Bob Lettyham was uh, Esther Green, and that's our, our country house. And uh, Marty uh, had taken these wonderful pictures for an article in, in Western Living. So it was one of the first, actually, chapters that I, of the book I'd already written was a story that was Western Living in years ago about the transformation of this really dumpy uh, little <laughs> cottage into something quite beautiful that we enjoyed for and the story about the carpet, uh, which is uh, is the lead off in the in the article, is I bought that in uh, Istanbul in the year 2000, and I had been to a UNESCO conference close to Marmara earthquake, and I spent a week in Istanbul and found it absolutely fascinating. But I was also, and then in the end, did buy a carpet. Of course, I, Bob said, if you're going to buy a carpet, don't buy a postage stamp. He would call it postage stamp is like two by three, and what are you going to do with it? It's like a bath mat. So, he, so I ended up getting a 9 by 13 carpet. And as long as it could fit into a little case, I could take it home with me. I didn't want to ship it. And I negotiated with the, uh, the dealer near the Grand Bazaar and had someone scurry off to the market to come back with this black nylon case that folded up uh, and fit in the bag, and I took it home with me. But the, it reminds me of what's happening in Turkey even today with earthquakes that are, that are, that are devastating the country. And the buildings that are built that continue to be built without proper uh, structural uh, design. And that was happening in the year 2000 as well. So right after the Marmara earthquake, where 17,000 people were killed, they were building new buildings exactly the same way. And they, the regulations and the authorities uh, turn a blind eye to what's supposed to be a six-story building that ends up being an eight-story building, with no reinforcing, no cross bracing. And ironically, it's the historic timber frame buildings, which we looked at as well, that survived the earthquake. They're ductile. They, they kind of move around quite a bit in the earthquake, and they might have shattered plaster, but they don't collapse. But it's the concrete buildings that uh, uh, pancake that are I, all through Central Asia. I think you'll find uh, horror stories of things like that. So that the carpet brings back that memory. Some of the houses that I've designed uh, are all over the map stylistically. The Point Grey Road, the three houses of Point Grey Road, had in the late 80s. Also, late 80s, uh, quite a sprawling. Uh, this is in my Robert Stern phase. So this is the longest <laughs> Robert Stern with I don't know how many Doric columns uh, for Joe and Joe and Hussein and on the waterfront. And it remains a uh, well, quite a wonderful project to be able to involve in the interiors and Bill Reed, the landscape architect of the landscape. And in the middle is a uh, my arts and crafts phase is a house that in the Southlands that I designed it. And I managed to get uh, stucco approved in Southlands, and the guidelines don't talk about a lot of stucco in but I said, no, it's Scottish Harley, which is what uh, Macintosh used in his houses in Scotland, it's called Harley. So they were, I was able to make that comment. But I think it's since been covered in shingles since. And then uh, another one in uh, Point Grey uh, for Joe, uh, Sam and Patty Goodwill. It was actually an addition to a 1920s Georgian house. So I, I we wanted to keep it in kind of a kind of a classical Georgian way and, and talk them into doing, instead of French doors, triple hung windows. And Sam was a big history, history buff. And uh, he knew about Monticello and that uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson had designed triple hung windows in, in Monticello. So he has uh, 
and I think there's 17 sets of triple movements that all have a proper uh, lead weights, and the case is well designed by uh, the Huge Woodworks in, in Victoria. A couple of island houses, uh, Janet Campbell particularly, was a very good client and a very good friend of the Vancouver Heroes Foundation. I designed first a kitchen for her in Vancouver. She lived in the CDK Van Norman house, and Ron Tom had done the sunroom, and I got to do her kitchen. And then she entrusted me to do this uh, reconstruction, or re-erection re of a, a Nova Scotia oak frame uh, maritime house from the 18th century, which Larry Killam convinced her to buy. And the timbers are all shipped to her in Indo Island and re-erected in the same shape. And then I got to have the, the joy of figuring out how to clad it, what, what it should look like. So we had a historic photograph to work with. So it's sort of a recreation, but all the expo historic timbers are exposed on the inside. And then the last house I did for her was uh, in, in near City Hall. This is the back of what's called the McLean House. And it was a, quite a distinctive, uh, highly decorative kind of Queen Anne house uh, with this unusual big bricks. It's like jumbo bricks on the outside. Well, it turns out they weren't jumbo bricks. They were actually terracotta blocks, and they were hollow inside. And so we they had a particular glaze that had a bronze and kind of a amber tint. So I thought that the addition on the back, which is the new kitchen and dining wing, very contemporary, uh, should be done in bronze. So all the detailing is done in bronze and glass. And you can see that the original exterior blocks are still kept through the windows. You can see that the old exterior is now an interior wall. That was on the Vancouver Heritage House tour a few years ago. A uh, couple more houses that I designed are quite dis very, very different. Uh, it's both on Galley and Ohio. Um, and uh, for like, the couple from England, actually, they commissioned me to design this house on the right while they were in England. So it was all done by fax machine and, and uh, telephone calls. And they kind of gave me free reign to, to design a, a kind of a timber house for them. And for their son, uh, the bottom left is still not finished. It was a, unfortunately a COVID uh, shutdown project. Uh, uh, cottage that has several different pieces with a corten steel uh, base for the 20 meter swimming pool. But it was based on the uh, time I spent at uh, Showback in Nova, in Nova Scotia, Brian McKay Lyons uh, compound there with the little corten steel house that I stayed in for a week while I was actually designing this house. I did a model of a little bits of cardboard and egg crates and things. Uh, the last house that we actually lived in and I worked on was Jameson House. Uh, and I worked, got to work with Foster Partners and Walter Frankel. And uh, I was the, did the restoration work on the two historic buildings there. And we ended up buying a suite 3403 and lived there for a couple of years actually. And in this uh, kind of Jetsons uh, lifestyle with this uh, high tech kitchen with a hydraulic island that went up and down glass countertops. It was pretty, pretty spiffy, um, but it, it felt more like staying in a hotel, so we, we, uh, we ended up selling that. But it was, working with Foster and Partners was uh, quite a experience, that's why I say at the beginning I do have a, a connection to Lord Foster, uh, working with his firm, and the, the care that they took in designing the tower that hovers over, what I can't believe is over, the two quite small historic buildings. And uh, it could have been done in many different ways, but they were, took a great deal of care to make sure that the, the historic building, particularly the separate Roundsville building, which is the one on the right, was kept intact during the entire construction process. So the only thing that was taken out was the floor, but they kept the whole superstructure, the roof, everything was hung with a huge truss that went the whole length of the site, 130 <coughs> feet, uh, from the street, uh, from Hastings Street to the lane, and basically this big truss of this bridge that suspended it from above while they built the parking uh, vault underneath. You know, this building has an underground elevator parking system that's quite sophisticated. So it's a big vault of parking underneath this. The last, uh, uh, probably the most comprehensive house that I worked on was the Rogers Mansion at Shannon for Wall Financial. I worked with Perkins and Will on this and my job was the uh, looking after the three historic buildings and the perimeter wall the gardens and the interior. And uh, it was a great opportunity to, to have kind of a comprehensive look at, at uh, returning at least parts of the building to its original appearance because we had ar archival photographs 
to be this one on the upper right. And uh, worked with a wallpaper designer in New York to have the, the uh, original wallpapers recreated. Now, the color scheme is, is conjecture. Because we know what the pattern was, we know the scale, it's exactly right. We know how many colors there were from black and white photos. But we didn't know what the actual colors would be. But she worked, Laura McCoy, she worked with um, oops, there, uh, the Smithsonian uh, uh, has a wallpaper collection in New York at the Cooper, Cooper Union Museum. And so she, we know that the, the interior decorators for this were from New York in 1925. And she felt that this color scheme, this greens and kind of magenta, um, uh, burgundy and salmon and gold, is likely would have been the case to people that were having a grand kind of wallpaper like this at the time. So I pinned it up on the wall and I was waiting for, for Peter Wall to say no, and he loved it. So that we got $75,000 worth of custom wallpaper <laughs> that he paid for. So. And then my, the last chapter is uh, called Seven and Nine. And uh, you, some of you may know that I've moved to Stratford, Ontario. And uh, Stratford, Ontario is a, a remarkable small city, same size as St. Thomas, but a lot nicer in many ways. Because it has the theater, it has, it actually, it's interesting, the sign, uh, you're driving to town, 30,000 people. You're driving to town, the sign says, Welcome to Stratford, home of the Stratford Festival and the Ontario Pork Congress. So it has both culture and agriculture, and it, that overlap and the mixing makes it quite remarkable. And there's a, a, a fascinating number of people that have moved to Stratford because of this kind of vitality. It's not just, it's not just a theater town, it's a real farm town. It's in the middle of this very uh, productive agricultural area in southern Ontario. It's uh, far enough from Toronto that you don't feel the, the pressure, but if you want to go, there's a train that would take you to Toronto. And, uh, it, it, and I was interested in Stratford, particularly because of this building. And um, a number of you here have stayed in this building. And it was designed by Shin Sutcliffe. Uh, it's called the Tower House in, in 2001. And it was the, adjacent to a restaurant. And the restaurateur, uh, Jim Morris, and he has a longstanding uh, history in Stratford of reviving and, and developing the restaurant and food industry in Stratford, which is quite quite remarkable. Started the chef school and, and had commissioned Shin Sutcliffe to renovate the restaurant and to build a house for himself called the Tower House. And it's called the Tower House because it is skinny, 16 feet wide by about 45 feet high, 60 feet long. There's a concrete wall that, that is the, the uh, joins the two buildings, and you can see the concrete on both sides of the restaurant and the tower house. And has this remarkable interior that has is just uh, the detailing and, and uh, cedar and fir is uh, astonishing. Every nail is, is precisely uh, located <coughs> on custom millwork, custom metalwork, and it still looks like that uh, 21 years later. And I run it as an inn, so I'm an innkeeper. Uh, so if you want to come to <laughs> Stratford State, you can stay at the Tower House. And there's influences there. I mean, I talk about the, the architects that I've mentioned. There's Alvarado and Shin Sutcliffe, I think, recognize that they, they look to influences like Carlos Scarpa, Alvarado, Patty Landau. These are all present in, in, this, in this building. And I'm uh, happy to, uh, to be now an Ontario resident. And um, so that's, that's what I have to say. And I wanted to thank Inform and the team at Inform for uh, arranging this talk. I, I, I'm, this is the first launch of my book, and uh, I'm thrilled to have it here. And I also want to thank uh, Trevor Bodie, who very kindly wrote the blurb on the back of the book. And uh, I, I'll know what price that blurb is after dinner. I get to dinner tab tomorrow night. I'm taking a look at the <laughs> published on Maine. He wants to go to publish on Maine. So there we go. That's the price of a blurb on the book. <laughs> Uh, also, the Christopher Foundation, John Fiegel, very, uh, didn't need much convincing to help me financially with, with the book. And it's a, 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 a offer uh, in, in, indulgence, I'd say, but I, I'm quite happy that it came through. Oro editions are the publishers, they do mainly the architectural uh, publications, and I work with their book designer, Pablo Mandel, who's in Buenos Aires, actually, and, and he designed this book, which I think is is uh, remarkable. I knew I wanted photographs in it, and he very, very wisely chose how they would be arranged and, and the simplicity of them. And I didn't intentionally didn't want fancy uh, uh, 
Edward Hinsky photographs, except for Marty and, and uh, the two Martins that are professional photographs. Uh, mostly they're my, my photographs, and I, he worked with that very, very, very well. The Vancouver Heritage Foundation was very helpful in, in kind of coordinating the, uh, the publication of the book. And, and Joseph Wasp, where is Joseph? Joseph Wasp was uh, very kind in helping me with the book. And, had some very kind comments when he read parts of it, and um, that this is the kind of thing. And why would why would anyone want want to read my memoir? Well, it might be of interest to other budding architects or people that want to go into the field of architecture, or maybe they're graduated from the studies in architecture. That this is the way a career path can can uh, take take way. You might become a planner. You might become a landscape architect. You might become an interior designer. You might be all of those things, or a landscape architect or an industrial designer, but your, your influences uh, of where you learn and live and the people that influence you, I think it's the story that it, more than about me, it's about the people that influence me and the places that influence me. So I, I appreciate the words that, that Yosef said about that. Uh, that so I hope that it's, you find it interesting and resonating, and um, thank you all for coming tonight. Mother's chili sauce recipe. Or, uh, <laughs> what's the fifth uh, famous pasta in Rome? There's the four famous four pastas. Anatrana and Carbonara. The fifth pasta is Alfredo. And I have a complete uh, description of having fettuccine Alfredo. In, 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 in. And there's only three ingredients: uh, fettuccine, butter, and cheese. There's no cream. There's no, there's no prawns, there's no chicken nuggets, <laughs> there's no garlic, it's just three ingredients in fettuccine and Alfredo. Thanks for coming. There's a refreshment still upstairs? Or um, no, but we're early. So. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any okay. questions, anyone? Does anyone have questions for us? There is one. What advice would you give a young person and how to pick a place to live? <laughs> a place to live. Yeah. Or to go to school or to either. I don't know. It, it, interesting for me, I never I had never been to Ottawa before I went to Carleton and I went to literally sight on the But I found it a remarkable, very interesting place to live and study there because of the opportunities that the capital city has for museums and galleries and amenities like the Rideau Canal and the parks around it. So having a, a access to uh, cultural amenities and uh, kind of a population that are interested in various things. I think makes a, a place sometimes more interesting than others. It's interesting comparing Stratford to, say, Niagara on the Lake, which is the other theater town in Ontario, and probably some of you have been there. It is almost completely um, related to the theater and tourism specifically. And it has a certain a one note quality to it, and it feels a bit, it's not fake, I and mean, they're all historic buildings. But it does feel a bit contrived and, and a one person purpose to go there. Whereas Stratford, there are, even in the dead of winter, it's a fascinating place to, to see. And there are many creative people come there because of its, um, its history, its architecture, the amenities. It has this magnificent park system right in the center of the city. I mean, it's, I live right across the street from this lake and this park system. And there's Kennedy East, more Kennedy East than you want. And there's an outdoor pool at five minute wet walk away in the summertime. So those are all things that I think a place that has had history that uh, contributes to the value and the uh, attributes of a place that it would be desirable to, to live or to, or to study. Yes? What do you miss about Vancouver? Uh, well, I, things I've noticed since I've been back on Sunday, the, the barge is gone. <laughs> uh, uh, Broadway is still torn up for the subway, which is not for good why they're building a subway, I have no idea, but anyway. Um, what do I miss about Vancouver? I miss Rainbow Island Market, I miss seafood, I miss Asian food. Almost nothing you can get in Stratford. I mean, there are restaurants that have imported things, but there's no, there's no seafood market in Stratford. So I do miss uh, the, the climate uh, is better, although I don't mind 
snowy, crisp winter days when it's, it's bright out. And interesting, Stratford is a little bit further south, so it has longer days. Even this time of year, the days are a little longer. So it's a, it's, I've lived in Vancouver for f over 40 years, and uh, I enjoyed living here. But I'm happy to return. Kind of roots are kind of compelling, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Yes? Can you share uh, some of the most happy moments in your Oh, well, you know, when the, the Galliano Island House I built for uh, Gene Hodgins and John Hodgins, and when they lived in England, and they moved back to, to uh, Canada, and that was their, their weekend house. Every time she would go there, she'd phone me and say, I'm so happy you're in the kitchen, because the kitchen was the first thing we designed, and I, I talk about kitchens quite a bit in my book, because I like to cook. And so she, every time I'd go, she would phone me and say how happy she is in that house. To hear a client say how happy they are, rather than complaining about the bill or the movies, is, and having repeat clients too, is, is probably one of the most rewarding things to have. Janet Campbell has three projects that, that she entrusted me with. Uh, I think the um, studying in Rome was very uh, important for me, and I spent six months. I didn't talk very much about it here because this is focusing on houses. But uh, the time is spent in Rome, I spent six months studying restoration architecture at EPROM, the International Center for Conservation. And that was a real uh, important time for me because the friends I made there, Benta and Inez, became long-term friends. And so I worked with Benta on two of the books that she's written on, on the colors of Rome and the colors of, of Copenhagen. And I'll talk about that next week at, at Highcroft. I'll another talk, completely different talk, next week at Highcroft and Vancouver Heritage Foundation. So having uh, made those connections uh, at a place at that, that time in my career, and I came back and started my own practice right after that in 1984. So I think the wrong time was probably the most uh, important, and, and yes, probably happiest for the time. Trevor. Uh, Robert, I hadn't realized that it's a whole different talk next week, but I'm just going to say you've slighted your own, your own work as a preservationist, which is pretty astonishing, and you've, helped, you've helped shape the city through a heritage work of many sorts. I guess that's going to come next week. That is but fun. the nice advantage, though, is you're leaving town. Can you give us some advice? Whisper in our ear what we need to do I have no about our stock of building and to change a little bit of the course that we've been <coughs> stuck in. I, I am uh, astonished <coughs> and amazed. And actually, the one liberation of moving to Stratford is that I can be an advocate now. Uh, when I lived in Vancouver, I could never open my mouth to say what I really thought was going on, because I might have to go to City Hall and get a permit or whatever. <laughs> very <laughs> <laughs> I had to always be very, very, very careful what I said, but I can do that now in Stratford. And there's, there are issues in Stratford. Ontario has gone through a whole uh, Doug Ford government has stripped the heritage legislation uh -huh. so they can build more housing. And it's just a completely bogus argument. So I love what ha what's happening here in Vancouver with rezoning changes that allow more debt, which it sounds great, but it's going to put infinitely more pressure on the stock of very historic buildings in the city. And I don't know how they're going to be able to compete with the build a sixplex on a single lot. Why would anyone keep the old building? And I don't know what other incentives there are. So I, I honestly don't know what to, what to suggest. But I know in Stratford, I'm, I'm arguing to save the historic first hospital in Stratford with a team of people. They've all come from other places. One of the people on our committee is from, we have been a curator at the CCA in Montreal. So another one is a businesswoman from, uh, from Toronto. Another is a lawyer who moved from Vancouver. So we're all waiting in on trying to save the historic hospital from demolition to make the parking lot. So, you know, I feel like my, my, uh, my job isn't done, being retired, <laughs> it just carries on in a different guise, but I could be a little more uh, open-mouthed about what I, my opinions are now. So. Well, we'll call you when we need you to let it rip. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> so I can, I can talk as an outside advisor. And, and actually, people, Joseph has signed the, the petition for this hospital in, in Stratford, and maybe a couple other people have as well. So uh, we have 1,600 people on our change.org petition to save uh, the Stratford's first hospital. And it's not dissimilar to the Heather Pavilion here. I know the struggles that many people went through. Marguerite Ford went through to say, try to save the Heather Pavilion. I mean, these are incredibly important places.
that are part of our uh, history, and they still have a value in being reworked. And uh, so I don't have a specific answer to your question, but I do worry that uh, a sixplex on a single family lot is going to destroy an awful lot of not just heritage buildings, but heritage landscapes. So it's kind of, uh, there are lots of other ways that density could be added to, to Vancouver that are not on sites that have heritage buildings. And there's got to be a better way to, to sort that out. Yes? Oh, well, uh, I'll talk about it next week, actually. Mamie Angus's kitchen. So she asked me, Mamie is a very good friend and a friend of the Vancouver Heritage. Is she here tonight? Is she here? She's not well. Oh, yeah, okay. She's pretty uh, so she entrusted me to design her kitchen on her lovely house with her, her husband, late husband, uh, Art Renison, in, in uh, Shaughnessy. And it was a big craftsman house, and, and but it had an awkward kitchen in the back. And so I proposed three Three alternatives. One was a, quite a traditional, uh, you know, just kitchen layout with a center island and walls of cabinetry. And but she had a uh, she had been in the business of uh, French country antiques for, for many years with with the Sherry Killam, and she had this enormous French Provencal break front that was like 12 feet long and about eight feet high. And she said, well, I want to use this in the kitchen. So I came up with a plan based on uh, Edwin Lutchins. And so I'd happened to be a big fan of Edwin Lutchins and had been to his Castle Drogo in Devon. And it's a, uh, quite a remarkable building. It's a national trust now. But the pantry there is, it's not unlike uh, Downton Abbey kitchen scullery, but it has a circular uh, island, circular table, and a circular um, square room with a dome and a, a central skylight. And I convinced Mamie and Art to have a central island, seven feet wide, and two sinks, rather than a traditional kitchen. And it worked perfectly. What do you do with the refrigerator? Well, there's no place to put a refrigerator. She was quite happy to have it hidden around the corner in the, in the pantry. So there was no refrigerator in the room. It looked like a, you know, a city room. And so that gave me a great deal of pressure. And we were invited, Bob and I were invited to uh, the first Thanksgiving they had to, to initiate this kitchen. And there we are. Standing around this island, there were four of us. Uh, Bob was mad, writing the potatoes, and I was doing the salad, and Mamie was doing something else. So we all worked harmoniously around this round island, and it was probably the, the happiest <laughs> kitchen moment that I've had. But it is based on you know history, and I remember these things. I remember seeing this, being amazed by this this uh, pantry of uh, Edwin Lutchins that you were discussing. So everybody has influences, and I think even very very contemporary architects like Jim Sutcliffe and other very celebrated architects like Brian Elia admire all their work, but they do have references to historic places and, and reinterpret them in a different way. But there's always a connection to uh, how it's been done before. Mm -hmm. And as the ar architectural history professor, Meredith Sykes, I don't talk about her, but uh, it's another story. Uh, she said there's nothing new under the sun in architecture. Everything mm -hmm. is it's a process of being reinvented or reconfigured in a way. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we have books for sale on lane four. And Robert yep. will be signing them. Get them here while you can at $45 to $80 because if you go to Amazon, it's $69. Okay? There's a problem in the, uh, the pricing in the ISDN number. So here you can get it for $45. Otherwise, it's going to wait for a couple weeks until the pricing is correct if you buy the book, book warehouse or in the road, it's all screwed up. So get it here where you can. So, wonderful.